is a search for a cure. The first multi-center, multidisciplinary collaboration to examine pancreatitis in children. Our second speaker will speak on medications used in the management of pain in pediatric pancreatitis. Dr. Jay Freeman is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. He serves as the Director of Digestive Health at the Emory and Children's Pediatric Cystic Fibrosis Center, as well as the Director of the Advanced Pancreatic Care Program. He has co-authored national and international guidelines related to the care of pancreatitis in children. And most recently, and pertinent to today's talk, he served as the lead author on the Naspigan position paper on the treatment of chronic pancreatitis in children. Our third speaker will speak on how the psychologist help psychological interventions in alleviating pain in pediatric pancreatitis. Dr. Tonya Polemo is a pediatric psychologist and professor of anesthesiology and pain medicine at the University of Washington. She leads a clinical research program in pediatric chronic pain at Seattle Children's Research Institute, dev devoted to understanding how to help children and adolescents cope with painful conditions. And our fourth speaker will speak on non-medication options in the management of pain in pediatric pancreatitis and will highlight the role of physical therapy, sleep, and others. Dr. Hatzel is an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Management at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. She's one of the chronic pain physicians at Cincinnati Children's Pain Clinic and Pancreas Care Center. She was previously at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta with Dr. Freeman, where she was the pain leader in the development of the Advanced Pancreas Multidisciplinary Clinic. And our fifth speaker is a parent and will give us a parental perspective on strategies for alleviating pain in pediatric, in pediatric pancreatitis. Jenny Jemison holds several titles. However, for the purpose of this event, she wants to be known as the mother of two lovely daughters who have been diagnosed with hereditary pancreatitis. Again, thank you for coming for this wonderful event and we'll take questions at the end of the talk. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, Dr. Hooch. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. Decay. It's wonderful being here. Um, so this is the title of my talk. And these are my disclosures. So this is the outline. I will talk about the origins of the pain and the patterns of the pain and how pain impact the lives of the children and the current pediatric studies. Abdominal pain is the most common symptom in pancreatitis, uh, acute, acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis. And as you all know, it's the most disabling symptom, but it's very poorly characterized. So there is a uh, very little known about the origins and uh, about the pattern. Uh, but, on, but on the other hand, it impacts the quality of life uh, significantly. Many of you may be familiar with this, uh, but there is a progression of the disease in pancreatitis. About one in 10,000 kids would get acute pancreatitis for many, many reasons. And about 15 to 35% will get recurrent acute pancreatitis, the rest will completely recover. And we know that the genetic reasons or some anatomical reasons play a role in this. In between attacks, they will be fine, uh, but a portion of them would advance to uh, chronic pancreatitis. Again, it's not a common disease, about two in 100,000. And we know that the genetics play a role in this. And those kids would have scar in their pancreas or stones in their ducts, and then they uh, will have to deal with this disease long term. And uh, when we looked in the Inspire cohort about the average age of diagnosis for chronic pancreatitis was around 10. 
Uh, we rely really on the imaging findings for the most part for the diagnosis of pancreatitis. I mean, those are the CT images and I put acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis, the schematic finding that correspond to this. So, you know, the CT images, this is like when you take a section and then you look down and you see here the spine and then the liver and the spleen and this, the pancreas is uh, right in the middle here. I don't know if my cursor shows, but uh, I mean, that kind of like this, this sausage uh, looking thing, it's, it's in the back of the abdomen and it just gets swollen and inflamed and causes pain. Uh, and in between attack, the pancreas can be completely normal. Uh, in patients with chronic pancreatitis, you see that this is a pretty small kind of atrophied gland. Uh, the ducts in the middle uh, is very, that, that black or darker looking structure is, is dilated and there are calcifications. So in the pancreas, of course, we have those ducts, that this long structure that you see in, uh, in, in the schematic image. So I just think about like the highways that that uh, drain the fluid from the pancreas into the small intestine that helps with the digestion. Uh, and also, you know, there's uh, the parenchyma or the, the tissue that makes the enzymes. And uh, you have nerves, of course, that sense things. And of course, there are the islets that makes the endocrine cells. So it's a, it's a complex structure with a lot of things in it. And when the pancreas is inflamed and chronically inflamed, um, you know, uh, all those structures are under, under stress. Um, so what is the origin of the pain? If, if I want to explain it in, in a very simplistic manner, is this the electrical system? Is this the wiring that just sends those stimulus, the, this, this triggers, or is this the plumbing uh, that, that the highways that are just blocked? Uh, so let's, let's talk about that. So in this image where you see the A, uh, that's, that's the plumbing theory, which means that the, the gland is under a lot of pressure. Uh, the, the ducts, the highways that I've shown you is, is blocked, uh, or there's inflammation, and there's a lot of pressure on the gland. Uh, so then the approach would be you do endoscopy, you take out the, 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 the stones, or uh, you do surgery and somehow relieve the pressure, and perhaps the child will get better. And then it could be the times that, that this will work. Um, but the uh, sensitization theory that starts in B here is that the nerves just get sensitized and just somehow just carry all those signals uh, to the spinal cord uh, here that looks like a butterfly and then to the brain. And then somehow that, that whole mechanism is, uh, is in an overdrive uh, in, in that uh, the picture on the, on the left within the square, what it shows that, um, I mean, the, the skin sensors, uh, I mean, the nerves that get the, the, um, uh, the, the feelings uh, from the skin just are in an overdrive. So when you touch the, the, the belly of the child, uh, it could be that there, there's an increased sensation. We call that allodynia. Uh, the, the things that, uh, the nerves that come from the pancreas actually are oversensitized. So there's an increased uh, uh, transmission of the nerve um, uh, feelings. Uh, and sometimes uh, the, the sensation that comes from other parts of the, the intestine, colon or small bowel are felt as they shouldn't be felt. And then there could be an increased feeling. Uh, and, and normally there would be inhibition or suppression of those transmissions and that is lost. So um, that whole thing is, I mean, think about like a phantom pain. Uh, when you take out something, I mean, the nerves are just so in an overdrive that there's still that feeling. So there are just those two theories. Where's that coming from? From animal studies, from adult studies, and we don't have those studies in children to know exactly what's going on. The patterns, uh, it's usually the pain is in the uh, center of the abdomen. It may go to the back. Uh, it will often get worse with eating. It may be episodic, which means it will come and go or continuous. 
Uh, the child may have times without pain. There may be times uh, with significant amount of pain, and it may be at a location away from the pancreas. I think when I say that we don't quite understand the patterns of the pain, that's what I'm uh, talking about. Uh, something to keep in mind that the age plays a factor. Uh, older children verbalize uh, their pain much easier than the younger kids, infants and toddlers, so that the, the diagnosis may be challenging in this age group because of this, and it may take months and years uh, to uh, really get um, to a diagnosis. So uh, a lot of the, uh, the uh, experience that I will tell you is from the INSPIRE study that I have been involved since its inception in 2009. And the study has been uh, in NIH funded since 2012. Now we have uh, 25 sites of which four are international. Uh, this is a longitudinal cohort study. So we're, we're basically following the kids over time. Um, and um, we have 685 patients. We only enroll kids with acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis. It's an observational study with the hope that uh, to better understand, uh, since this is such a rare disease, uh, and also with the hope that we will develop better uh, uh, diagnostics and better treatments. So how is the pain pattern? Uh, so this is, uh, this is a new data from the INSPIRE2 cohort. Uh, just wanna uh, get your attention that there's quite a bit of pain uh, in the acute recurrent pancreatitis, 88% uh, described some sort of pain within the last year. In the chronic pancreatitis, uh, 77%. Uh, so that's, I mean, acute recurrent pancreatitis is related to the attacks. Uh, the patterns of pain, uh, what I just want to tell you is just there's a variety of presentation uh, and description of the pain. Uh, that's usually what we see in pancreatitis. What is uh, worth noting is that with acute recurrent is mostly episodic, with chronic is mostly constant. About a third of the kids in acute recurrent pancreatitis use pain medications pretty regularly, and about half of the kids with the chronic pancreatitis use pain medications quite regularly. Um, we did a study when we compared this to a large uh, a cohort of uh, patients with chronic pancreatitis. So what I want to uh, get your attention to, which is the top part of the table, uh, is that when you compare kids to adults uh, and the pain intensity and experience, there wasn't a lot of difference. What, what it says that the kids also experienced quite a bit of pain. Uh, the pain medications that were used uh, in the pediatric versus adult uh, cohort, um, the, the adults use the pain medications a little bit more, perhaps were under treating the kids for pain that could be interpreted like that. Um, the 57% the of the kids were using some pain medications versus 70% of the adults. Uh, narcotics uh, uh, with some narcotic use was 40% in the pediatrics versus 63% in the adults. Um, and then um, exorcine pancreatic insufficiency, about a quarter of the kids had uh, their pancreas just completely stopped working that they had to take enzymes versus this was about a third of the adults. And the diabetes is about 5% in the, uh, in the chronic pancreatitis with kids versus about a third of the adults had diabetes. Again, I think those numbers for us can change because we're uh, uh, diagnosing diabetes um, much better. Uh, we have studies to uh, identify uh, uh, diabetes better now. Uh, I just want to give you uh, a snapshot of what does pain mean in terms of its impact on kids' lives? And this is going to be uh, presented at the Digestive Disease Week, which is one of our large GI meetings uh, the, this, this weekend. Uh, so if you have significant amount of pain or pains that come with uh, epi episodes like come and go, significant pain, uh, the kids are more likely to have uh, increased number of emergency room visits. Um, Frequent abdominal pain, we found that predicts a uh, high number of hospitalizations. Uh, and frequent abdominal pain, again, predicted uh, missed school days, a uh, high number of uh, missed school days. How about an opioid use? I mean, this is something we want to avoid in the pediatrics. Um, uh, yet again, in the cohort, uh, the kids, about 17% of them, used uh, opioids frequently, which is about um, uh, a week, at least uh, weekly or daily. 
Uh, and what are the predictors of that? Uh, in our cohort was uh, age at diagnosis being a little late and being late means uh, 10, 10 and a half uh, mean age. Um, I mean, the other group was eight and a half. So still pretty pediatric. Uh, the duration of the disease didn't make any difference. PRSS1 mutation uh, was associated with a higher risk. Uh, so uh, was exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So advanced disease, uh, late um, onset, later onset uh, was associated. Um, uh, some other pain patterns associated with the opioid use, what we found is uh, if uh, the kids were having constant pain or a significant number of pain episodes per month, um, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, or they were missing quite a, bit, quite a bit of school, or they were using an antidepressant at that time, that was also associated with opioids. Uh, another significant thing that if uh, they were using frequent opioids, that was impacting their, uh, their uh, daily lives, uh, such as socializing with others, uh, participating in school activities, or other re uh, recreation activities and enjoying them and day-to-day -day activities and ability to concentrate. So definitely uh, opioids was um, uh, an end result of significant amount of pain and disease burden and impacting the kids' lives. Now I'm going to shift to current studies and what we do within INSPIRE. I'm not going to talk too much about WebMap. This is something that Dr. Palermo is going to focus. Uh, this is a, a non-medication, uh, non-opioid alternative that we try to come up. Uh, it's a placebo, uh, it's, it, it's a controlled, uh, randomized controlled study uh, that we have uh, looking into cognitive behavioral therapy um, as an option for kids with acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis. Uh, another study that we're currently uh, running, it's uh, getting uh, to a closure, is we want our patients and families to tell us what is most important to them, what is the most relevant symptom, uh, what most importantly disrupt their, their lives, their quality of life, uh, and are there any research topics that they want us to look into. I mean, this is uh, a rare disease, and the INSPIRE cohort constitutes the only uh, longitudinal study in pediatric acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis. Is this something that we can help the field uh, to move forward? And this is the last study that I'm going to talk about, which is the CHAMP study. This is, uh, again, a collaboration between Seattle Children's and Dr. Palermo's team uh, that uh, I already told you that there is little known about the pain patterns in pediatrics. So with this, we're trying to identify the pain patterns and what leads to opioid use uh, and what, how it impacts the quality of life. So there is uh, a series of questionnaires that we would like uh, to work with the families and patients and see how that correlates uh, with clinical and demographic data. So that's uh, coming up soon. So um, I'm going to summarize um, uh, what I've said so far is uh, abdominal pain is common um, and it significantly impacts uh, children's lives emergency room visits, hospitalizations, days of school mess, quality of life. Uh, but yet again, this is not well characterized. Uh, the origins are not well known and we don't have specific guidelines about how to measure and yet again, how to manage abdominal pain in pediatrics. Uh, opioid use is relatively rare and I'm just gonna say this cautiously because 40% of some Opioid use is not rare. 17% uh, of frequent use is not rare, but this is just relatively compared to adults. So this is, uh, there are some patterns that we're trying to understand what leads to this. And uh, we are hoping to understand this more and to prevent it, hopefully. Uh, we have some studies uh, that are underway uh, to assess and treat pediatric pancreatitis, and we're hoping to have more in the future. So where can we go from here? How can we advance this field? Um, I think under, addressing the underlying causes uh, is the way to go. And you're, we're making progress in that field, but the field is still relatively new. Uh, and we really depend on uh, multi-center studies for this rare uh, childhood disease. Uh, I think we need tools to differentiate pancreas pain from non-pancreas pain so that we can understand when the child is in pain, how to assess it, how to guide the therapy. Uh, and then we need optimal management of the pain um, so that we can uh, help our uh, patients and families. 
and not only help the pain, but also how can we improve the quality of life? Uh, how can we help with the disease burden so our patients are not in the emergency room in the hospital uh, multiple times a year? Um, and then um, when is the ideal time to intervene uh, so that it doesn't go to um, becoming chronic, like all those nerve um, fibers don't get oversensitized, when, when is that best time? Uh, and are there measurable biomarkers so that we can assess the outcome of those interventions? So those are some of the things uh, that uh, I think we should be looking into the future. That's all I have. Um, I'll be happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uch, so much. That was a wonderful segue into, I think, what we're going to start talking about with a little bit more of the pain management stuff. Uh, thank you to Dr. DK and thank you to the MPF for inviting me. It's, it's always a pleasure to be able to interact with the community at large and especially families and, and possibly children out there. Um, I was given the task to discuss medications used in the management of pain in pediatric pancreatitis. Um, we are not going to be going medicine by medicine, but certainly talking about classes of medications and how we use these. Here is my disclosure slide, none of which are really pertinent to today's talk, except for maybe that I am the medical director of the Georgia chapter of the NPF. So I have drank the NPF Kool-Aid, I'm fully committed and a, a, a full member of the team. Our objectives really by the end of this is, is for everybody to understand that, that medications are only one aspect of treating pain in pediatric pancreatitis. It goes with the overall title. It's going to be what everybody talks about. Um, but I really want everybody to know that even though patients and doctors are always looking for the medical the miracle pill for every disease. Here, it's really only a small part of the equation. And as I said, we're not gonna review every pain medication. I want you to be able to implement a pain ladder approach when using analgesics or pain medicines and treating pain, and then be able to recognize various non-analgesic strategies to treat abdominal pain and pediatric pancreatitis. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in and, and going to hammer home that point just a little bit more that treating pain, it takes an entire team uh, very frequently with these patients. And why is that? Well, this is a wonderful slide. It's, it's a few years old now, but really talks about how pain develops and how it can be um, characterized by patients, sort of what Dr. Uch has already gotten at. But there's a number of things that can initiate the pain sequence, whether it be injury, something like pancreatitis, illness like viral procedures, even the unknown. And there's a lot of factors that, that really modulate that pain response. They start at very high levels, such as cultural um, values and, and how they perceive pain. Obviously, even around some families, it may be considered you know, weak to say that you're hurting, whereas others may be very sensitive to pain. And even at the individual level, there, there's genetics that go into play. We'll talk just so briefly about you know, just biology, whether there's other medical issues. All of these uh, will go towards the outcome, but the biggest thing is if we, if we look here at the interventions, there is a number of them. And again, medications seem to be on the top of the list, but it's really only a piece of the, the entire puzzle. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into to these different medications. Is that, that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. So we start with analgesic, and as Dr. Uch said, relatively speaking, there are less opioid use um, in children, but there are hundreds of different pictures or, or graphs that look just like this, and we all know. So in this particular one, we're looking from 1999 all the way to 2017 here on the y-axis, and the red bars here represent opioid use in the United States, and this uh, kind of dark blue line is deaths amongst males, and the kind of gray deaths among females from opioid overdoses. So we know that there's an opioid epidemic. We, we know that sometimes children um, go from not having had these meds to becoming addicted um, myself, I have had one patient who used the medications that I provided her to try to commit suicide um, with these medications. So this is not a nothing issue um, within our population. And it's actually a, a really big issue because pain management is an absolute principle of care for children with pancreatitis. 
So the figure I have here on the left is a, a diagram that myself and one of my fellows are putting together for a, a review that'll come out later this year, but really talking about the cornerstones of therapy and yes, fluid management and yes, monitoring and yes, nutrition are key aspects, but pain is also one of our absolute cornerstones. And when we look at it, we have things like NSAIDs and opioids as needed. And we, and we specifically try to talk about that when we start talking about acute pancreatitis and pain management. Um, that there are other medication alternatives. It used to be you came with pancreatitis, you got IV morphine, and you kept giving it to them until they weren't in pain anymore. And I think we've definitely evolved beyond that principle. This graph on the right comes from the group at Boston Children's, and it looked at basically incidents of acute pancreatitis with here on, again, the y-axis, the last one was X, but this is the percent of uh, acute pancreatitis encounters. And here on the X axis is how many doses of opioids they got. And those that only got one or two doses, you can see that the first medication they were given was actually a non-opioid medication. Whereas those that received three, four, five, or even more doses of opioids, the first medication they were given was an opioid, which tells us that for patients coming through the door, that if we just start them with narcotics, they're more likely to continue to use narcotics. If we show them there are other pain medications available that can treat their pain, they're less likely to use narcotics. And I think that's a very important point. Um, and it's one of the things that drives um, this figure here, which is the pain ladder, which um, was proposed in the recent NASPIC imposition paper. So actually myself and Dr. Hartswell were both a part of developing this pain ladder that very much mirrors what they do in oncology patients. The difference here is it's less of a ladder and more of a bit of a layered approach. And what I mean by that is if we look here at level one, which is the initiation of pain, mild pain, we want to start with non-opioids. When we talk about using NSAIDs such as Motrin or Tylenol, so we're talking about over-the-counter medications. And these medications can be alternated every three hours to keep a steady rate of pain medication on board. If that fails, we ideally want patients to have weaker opioids at home, something such as tramadol for patients over 12 years of age, maybe something more like hydrocodone for patients that are less. And the reason for that is tramadol does have a black box warning, which is the FDA's strongest warning against use in less than 12 years of age, because some patients metabolize the drug uh, poorly and are at risk for significant respiratory side effects. However, with that being said, there may be some of you out there that are less than 12 years old that have had tramadol, and I think many of us still use this medication, but with a lot of conversation with the families. If that doesn't work, then we're going to level three, which is now we're getting into our stronger opioids. Now, at this point, we would stop the weaker opioids. We're still layering this with the Tylenol and Motrin on board as well, because their mechanisms of action are different. Here's when we start getting into oxycodone, morphine, and evil and uh, oral hydromorphone. So this way we have different mechanisms of action working. And then the goal is that we're using less um, high strengths or lower doses of those opioids and stronger medications. And then finally, if they fail that at home, then we're going to the emergency room getting admitted for IV analgesics or stuff like IV morphine. So this becomes difficult when we're looking at our success rates, because in some ways we want to decrease opioid use. But if we're doing things correctly, they're not coming to the hospital until they actually need strong opioids. And one way to combat this is something called the pancreatitis passport. So I know many centers have started to adopt this. Um, this was um, published um, just a year ago by Zach Sellers, the group at Stanford, um, in conjunction with NASPGIN. And here you have the patient's name their pancreatitis history, their medications. And this is something that if you're out of town or even with your local emergency room, you can bring this piece of paper to a physician, to a provider, and they can see, okay, they've already tried these medicines at home. They really do need IV pain medicines versus they don't have something like this. They haven't tried all those other medications. We can start at something like an NSAID, a tramadol, something like that to try to prevent unnecessary use of stronger opioid medications. Now, Dr. Ush got into this a little bit, but we sort of transitioned from this acute pain to sort of the chronic pain and what can happen. So full disclosure, I, I totally took this slide from Dr. Hart Silver. It's one that she presented about two years ago with us, but I really loved it and wanted to talk about it briefly. So there's a lot of different receptors that, that feel pain in the body. And whether it's pancreatitis, virus, whatever, they get hit and they, they get hit and they get hit and they get hit. And this eventually just leads to this hyperalgesia, this intense pain pain signaling that actually goes all the way to the brainstem. 
And this can actually start leading to what's known as the wind-up phenomenon. So this is each trigger gets a little bit worse and a little bit worse and a little bit worse until you get to this point where you get to allodynia, which Dr. Uj talked a little bit about, where something that shouldn't hurt actually has a very painful stimulus. Think of a gas bubble going across your stomach that for most people might just signal I'm hungry, but for a patient who has this, it comes across as pain and leads to this idea of central sensitization. The other way I sort of think about this is the dripping faucet. So I don't know if you can hear me, but it's drip, drip, drip. And everybody's annoyed that I'm wasting time on this webinar tapping my finger and they're annoyed. But as soon as I stopped tapping my finger, your brain started looking for that next tap. And any little signal was enough to be like, okay, there it is. And that's sort of what's going on with the enteric nervous system or the nervous system in the gut, looking for that pain signal and giving this heightened response when it's there. So with that idea in mind, we're gonna to move to sort of these non-analgesic pain medications and how we use those to try to treat pain in pancreatitis patients. So one thing that Dr. DK touched on very briefly was PERD and pancreatic enzymes. And this goes to the feedback inhibition um, idea, or at least theory. And the idea is when you eat, there, there's acid in your stomach and that triggers secretin, which releases bicarb to neutralize the acid in your stomach. And then when the fat hits the small intestine, cholecystokinin or CCK is released, it causes your pancreas to release its enzymes. So one of the ideas is you can give acid suppression medicine, proton pump inhibitors, or pancreatic enzymes to dampen this physiologic response. And you would think that this negative feedback might get the pancreas to just calm down, not give so much of a stimulus. Unfortunately, though, this has never really panned out very well, especially in pediatrics. In adult patients, there are two studies that show a certain type of enzyme called viacase may decrease pain in adult chronic pancreatitis patients. But again, nothing in, a, in pediatrics, and there's not enough data for this to be widely used. With that being said, I'm sure there are some patients out there that are on these medicines, some that have even responded, but it's just not a blanket um, thing that we use for all patients. The other thing we start to do is, is we start looking at the pain cycle and we start trying to figure out where in this pain cycle we can intervene. Obviously, we sit here and we talk with pain, but pain leads to other things, guarding, spasms, inflammation. Then we get into mobility issues, weakness, functional issues which how can anybody who's not in chronic pain not have frustration, maybe a small touch of depression, and then we have the cycle. For my part, I'm gonna start here with the anger and come down to muscle spasms. And I think the rest of this circle is really gonna be touched on by, by our other speakers. So for the anger frustration, we, we think of tricyclic antidepressants. We're really not using these as antidepressants though, is that they are known to increase norepinephrine, which then downregulates pain transmission and thus central sensitization. The doses we use are actually much lesser than we use for depression, but we need to remember it may take weeks to, for it to be really effective. Now, this medication is, quite frankly, it, it's frequently discontinued because of side effects, things such as drowsiness, kids falling asleep at school, but more importantly, mood swings and even suicidal ideation. So these medications need to be used in, in close conjunction with an entire multidisciplinary team, going back to that point, and have honest conversations with families and patients about the pros and cons of these medicines. From there, we start about neuromodulators. We actually start trying to break that neurotransmission. Things such as gabapentin, also known as Neurontin or pregabalin, Lyrica, um, work at the neurotransmitter level. So gabapentin in particular was first discovered as a seizure medicine, but was noted to decrease chronic pain. And it does so by, again, decreasing nerve signaling in the pain pathways and decreasing that centralization and that pain. And pregabalin has a very similar mechanism of action as well. From there, we can actually try to get rid of some of these spasms and the inflammation through muscle relaxants. Uh, methocarbamol is, is our favorite. We use a lot of it. It's less sedating than the Flexoril and is generally very well tolerated um, and tends to go along with physical therapy and some of the other things that, that our other speakers will talk about. And then finally, get asked a lot about antioxidants. Um, in my opinion, they don't have a great pain profile, but I use it Frequently, there's essentially no side effects to antioxidants. I promote vitamin A, vitamin E, and selenium based on some of the research that's out there. 
in my anecdotal experience, it doesn't take away all pain, but it does decrease the severity. Um, and, and more importantly, the, the, the one study that's out there in kids only studied three patients in England. When they were on their antioxidants, they took less Tylenol. When they came off of them, their Tylenol levels went up um, and, and the cannon came back and forth. We certainly cannot change all of our management on a study of three patients, but again, no side effects may help a little bit, and it's something that's relatively easy to get a hold of. Now, final thing I really wanted to talk about was some of the directed interventions. Um, the one most people know about are celiac plexus block. There's also muscle trigger point injections and muscle sheath injections. But basically the point with these is that you can get a pain medicine directly to that nerve root that Dr. Uch talked a little bit about. So the celiac plexus in particular is where a lot of the nerve processing for the abdominal cavity goes. And so the picture here on the left can be an interventional radiology approach where they can actually pass a needle into this plexus. The only thing I don't love about this picture is it shows one needle going through the aorta, which we would never actually do. Um, but you can basically get right here to this nerve bundle and give medicine directly there to try to calm down that signaling. And then the other option is to do this through advanced endoscopy. So this is an endoscopic ultrasound, and you can see the needle here in bright white coming to this dark patch here, which is where the celiac bundle is. And you can inject the pain medication there. And if it works, but then begins to wear off, you can actually what's called cryoablation or essentially freeze this area to more permanently decrease that nerve signaling. Pediatric data is sparse, but it is certainly not overwhelming. There is no reports of this being extremely effective, even in adults. Um, it's used more in cancer patients, to be fully honest, but I have had a patient or two that I felt was the right patient for this and, and can be considered in a very select minority of patients. So my summary is this, there's a lot I didn't go over. I'd really try to get the 30,000 foot view here and sort of talk about medication classifications. Again, I'm hammering home this point. Pain medications are only one component of treating pain in children with pancreatitis. This takes a, a whole team, and I think that's going to become even more evident with Dr. Uch and Dr. I'm sorry, with Dr. Palermo and Dr. Hartzell. And there are many potential mechanisms for pain. We must match that mechanism with the medication or think about layering or multiple medications to treat several aspects of pain. That is all I have. I will take questions at the end. Thank you from the bottom of my pancreas. And finally, shameless plug. In college many years ago, I played college soccer at Marshall University, who won their first ever national title Monday evening. So that's my last chance to say go herd and congratulations to them. With that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Hi there. Thank you to Dr. DK and to the NPF for inviting me to talk today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to cover um, a little bit about psychological interventions for pain management in pediatric pancreatitis. And here's my brief overview. So I'm going to talk a little bit about biopsychosocial understanding, expand a little bit from what we've heard already, and then where do pain self-management interventions and psychological interventions specifically play a role, and then just present some resources for pain management. So this is similar to what, what you've seen from, from Dr. Freeman's talk, but I wanted to highlight how a biopsychosocial understanding really does inform why we use psychological interventions in chronic pain conditions. And so you can see in this slide that there are a variety of vulnerabilities that are important both in the onset of pain, but more importantly in the maintenance of pain over time. And you can see these include a broad range. So emotional vulnerabilities such as the amount of threat that someone feels from pain. Yes, Dr. Okay. Okay. Your, your slides are not advancing. Oh, they are for me, interestingly. Um, I 
I'm just going to stop the share for a second and start over with it. Okay, hopefully you can see this. <laughs> so as I was saying, there's a range of vulnerabilities. So these may be emotional vulnerabilities such as anxiety or depression, social and family vulnerabilities such as high family distress or disparities, neurobiological vulnerabilities, which you heard a little bit about already in terms of brain circuitry involved in chronic pain, and then health behavior vulnerabilities. These are things like sleep disturbance, substance use and physical activity. And what I've been really interested in my own work is really thinking about how these vulnerabilities can be targeted in psychological interventions. And importantly, how they can also really um, influence long-term management. So I also see young adults with chronic pain. And one of the things we think about is how can we provide earlier intervention so that we can really build resilience over the lifespan. So as, you, as you've already heard from Dr. Uch, pain does impact children with pancreatitis in a number of ways in terms of reducing capacity for physical activities, disrupting sleep, reducing psychological functioning, disrupting school attendance and performance, as well as social participation. But I also wanna highlight, because I think we haven't mentioned this, that when we think about the child with chronic pain, we really also think about the whole child, which includes the family. And when a child's having difficulties with pain, certainly it can affect parents as well as family members. And for many of the families that we work with whose children have complex chronic pain conditions, there's a lot of stress. There can be a lot of anxiety and fear about the condition, as well as some discouragement if there's not progress made with um, treatment plans. And when we ask teens and parents directly about their worries about chronic pain, they often talk about the future. And I wanted to just highlight a few quotes here because I think it's important, again, to just consider that there's real value in trying to teach effective pain management skills early on. As already mentioned, an ideal treatment approach then is interdisciplinary care. And I'm just gonna hone in on the psychological intervention part of this. So you may have heard the word self-management. It's used as a you know, form of treatment in many chronic conditions. And when we talk specifically about chronic pain, we're really thinking about what are those things that a patient can do themselves to minimize the impact of a chronic condition on their health and also to manage psychosocial problems that result. And so this really is about learning skills, learning behaviors for living well with a chronic condition, and also building confidence in managing symptoms and, and disease. And so pain self-management is included in most guidelines for addressing chronic pain care for both adults and children. And cognitive behavioral interventions are one form of psychological treatment that is a self-management strategy. It's really working with patients to give them the skills that they can enact on their own. It's empowering people to do things to manage their own health. And so these are, this therapy is based on theories of behavior, on cognition, emotion, and, and social learning. And again, it's really teaching children how to manage pain by learning new ways to think about it and to change some behaviors related to pain. So this includes uh, multiple strategies. We work on on cognitive interventions. These are things about how we, how we think about pain, how we approach situations where we might expect to experience an increase in pain. We often teach relaxation or deep breathing skills. This is a, a helpful strategy for managing both anxiety, stress, and pain, and um, additional interventions to engage more fully in physical activities and valued activities. And I think specific to children, something that's different in cognitive behavioral therapy that we don't do in adults is really that we also focus on parents and families in terms of whether there's other strategies that might be helpful. This can include everything from helping parents figure out how to incorporate more self-care for themselves into their lives to decrease stress in the family um, to other types of interventions. And then specifically, because school is such an important part of children's lives, we often include specific interventions for addressing school attendance or school functioning specifically. 
So there is a pretty good literature base on psychological therapies for the management of chronic pain. Most of these trials have been conducted in youth who have abdominal pain or headache, um, musculoskeletal pain. There have been fewer studies that have been done in kids with disease-related pain. And so far, none have been published in, in pancreatitis. But this slide shows a Cochrane review that I've worked on over a number of years. This is the most recent iteration of it from a few years ago. And you can see that, that there's good effects on reducing pain intensity and frequency, as well as disability and anxiety in children and adolescents. But one of the things we know is that although these interventions exist, most of our patients actually have difficulty and challenges trying to get into this form of treatment. And this is due to multiple reasons. One is there's a shortage of interdisciplinary pain treatment programs for children. In the US, there's about 50 programs. So in many states, that means there's one program in the whole state. So there's often long waiting list of typically three to six months to get into one of the clinics. And we know in particular that children compared to adults have even poorer access to psychological interventions for chronic pain. So I've been interested over the course of my career in really thinking about how to provide accessible options to this form of treatment. And so one of the things I've worked on over about a dozen years is an internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy program called WebMap. And this is a program that delivers some core treatment components of CBT for pain management. And um, in collaboration with Dr. Uch, we've actually transformed this for children and adolescents with pancreatitis and have an ongoing clinical trial. And this slide shows some information about the trial. We're targeting enrollment for children who are 10 to 19 years old who have chronic or acute recurring pancreatitis. And you can see um, a, a link here to get more information about the study, but wanted to make sure um, that I told you about that. So there are a number of resources. I think one of the positive effects of the pandemic has been the huge expansion of telemedicine in most of our hospitals. This has really expanded options for patients to receive psychological treatment who have, had not been able to previously. And so certainly in person or through telemedicine, finding a psychologist who has experience in GI conditions or in chronic pain um, is, a, is a wonderful resource. But when that's not available, there are some online resources. I'm gonna just flip through a few of my favorites. Um, there's also mobile applications and some online chats and support groups. So this is a, a organization that's in Canada called Solutions for Kids in Pain. They have um, a number of other resources. This is a, a, a link here, and I'm just showing part of a page they have on pain management apps and online resources, but there are a variety of, of nice um, resources that are linked through this site. This is a mobile app that I've created that's um, a version of our web-based management program, and it's been tailored to be delivered via a mobile app. It is freely available um, in the app store for both, um, both app stores actually. And then this is an online uh, resource called Comfortability. They also do in-person workshops around the country in various hospitals. And so you can see if there's locations close to you, but they also do some online activities, um, including monthly online chats through Twitter. And then last, this is a organization that is a nonprofit that's focused on teens with chronic pain and their parents. They provide educational resources and also a variety of um, online supports. And it, they really focus on this idea of creative healing. So in conclusion, as I think we have, a number of us have, have now mentioned, we, we know chronic pain affects many children with pancreatitis and can impact not only children, but also parents and families. Children with painful chronic pancreatitis may benefit from learning pain self-management strategies. And I do think this can provide skills that build resilience and positive coping over the life course. And so I think it's, it's super important to get kids exposed to these strategies in childhood. There are a number of resources for supporting pain management that are available both in person and online. 
And I think our own next steps as we continue to focus on developing accessible psychological interventions for pain management is really focusing on prevention. And I think Dr. Uch mentioned this as well, but it's important to think about, you know, chronic pain doesn't just start off chronic, right? All pain starts as acute pain. And so there's this window of opportunity that, that we have to think about how to intervene before a problem becomes chronic. And I think there's a, there's a huge role for psychological interventions in you know, disrupting that, that transition from acute to chronic pain. And also just wanted to acknowledge my lab. This is what we've kind of looked like over the last year. It's just a bunch of squares on the screen, but this is um, where we hope to return back to soon, which is our, a picture of our research institute. But thank you very much. I'm, I'll be happy to answer um, questions at the end. Okay, good, good evening. I'm uh, Cheryl Hartzell. I'm going to be talking about non-medication options in the management of pain in pediatric pancreatitis. I do not have any disclosures. So the objective, objectives really of my talk are going to be, we're going to break and review uh, how the chronic pain and functional disabilities related to pancreatitis develops. We're also going to be discussing various non-medication treatments and why each is important in treating chronic pain. So just to drive home, the pain system is our alarm system. This is how we know that something is happening within our body. Cheryl, your slides aren't on. My slides aren't on. Okay. Sharing the screen, how about this? Can you see it now? How about now? No. no nothing? Okay. Well, let's see here. How about now? Yes. Yeah, just put in presentation okay. mode, you'll be good. There we go. All right, so sorry about it. You really didn't miss much in my first few slides. So, all right, so our pain system is our alarm system. So when you have a, an episode of pancreatitis, your body is activating things. It is something is going on here. So your alarm system is literally going off. So how I explain this to my patients is now the firemen come. Their job is to put off the put out that pancreatitis. And these firemen, they get all excited and they're like, yes, we put out this fire. And sometimes they get so excited they forget to turn off your alarm. So now you have a little bit of baseline abdominal pain. So what happens when you have another episode of pancreatitis? How does your body know that something's going on? Well, your alarm has to get louder. And so that activates that as firemen. They come, they get excited again, too excited that they end up leaving that alarm on. And this unfortunately starts happening again and again until that alarm system is so sensitive, so activated, like Dr. Freeman had shown. And this can develop from pancreatitis called visceral hyperalgesia. This is a fancy word of just saying the viscera is any of your organs in your system. So it could be your pancreas and hyperalgesia is just pain that is hyped up. It is activated. So when this ends up happening, you have hospitalizations, you start having pain with activity. So what do you do? You go and do what your doctor tells you, you go and rest. But then you start getting fear of movement because every time you're moving, you're starting to get a lot of pain. So you start avoiding activity start having multiple school absences, body fatigue, poor sleep, and then those mood changes that Dr. Palermo and Dr. Freeman had talked about. All of this ends up li li giving you functional disability, which is essentially you're not functioning at the level that at your age you should be functioning. And so this can end up developing different kinds of pains because you're so bed bound, you're not moving as much. So you can start having little pain, meaning that you can have muscles in your abs that getting pain. You can start having back pain, you can start having joint pain, hip pain. And essentially this can turn over to all over pain, just starting from those pancreatitis episodes. So this is where we come into that multidisciplinary approach to pain. And you guys have already heard about the different pain, pain medications and also the pain psychology, both, both exceptionally important parts of this. But when my patients come into my clinic, the first thing I say is we're gonna be talking about regaining function. 
because we know as that function increases, our pain starts decreasing. So we do this through different things. We do this through physical therapy, aerobic conditioning, which is literally just having an aerobic plan, lifestyle changes, including diet and sleep hygiene, and also psychology and pain medications. Now, I tell my patients that for my medication regimen, that a good medication regimen brings down your pain about a third. If I can bring that pain down from a 10 to a seven, I bet you you can start moving. So it is not meant to take away all the pain, but it is to help regain that function. So with physical therapy, the goals that we're looking at is we wanna start moving in a safe way. We wanna start associating that pain, that movement without that pain. We wanna build confidence, trust your body more, build that muscle endurance, decrease that fatigue. And this is a complement to aerobic pro programs. So when my patients come into my clinic and I ask them, hey, what are we doing for exercise? And they say, well, I'm doing my physical therapy exercises. That doesn't count. That's just a compliment to it. That's just where we're getting to. And I always encourage my patients to talk with the physical therapist about your functional goals. Think about what you want to get back to. If you want to get back to cheerleading, baseball, football, if you possibly want to end up getting back to just walking from class to class without having to stop, maybe it's just going up the stairs. Discuss this with your physical therapist so that you can start buying into what you're doing and see the results for what you want to get out of it. So different PT methods. So these are things that they, therapies that they do within your therapy sessions. So the TENS unit, I love the TENS unit. This is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. This is something that you actually can purchase over the counter. Essentially what it is, is little electrodes that you put onto your different muscle groups. And it provides a very gentle electrical stimulus that overcomes that alarm system, that quiets it down with a good sensation. Electrical stimulation. So this is a fancier, more advanced model that a special training is needed by your physical therapist. And it has different modes that, diff that target different types of pain that is more specific than what a TENS unit. Heat and ice are still good modalities to use. And then ultrasound massage. This is essentially they use ultrasound waves that, that penetrate deep into those muscles and they really get down and decrease that muscle tightness. So you're looking at also decreasing that sensitivity to touch with Dr. Freeman had touched on with the allodynia, which is, um, which is pain to, to non-painful stimulus. And we're really quieting that alarm system. Another thing is myofascial release. So if you've ever had a knot in your back that you're trying to, to get out, this is what the physical therapist can do is really deep massage to break up those knots. I've seen them in, uh, in the abdominal muscles of my patients with pancreatitis because of how much guarding and crunched over they're doing. Stretching, strengthening, and education on your body ergonomics. When you're lying around a lot, your body gets off centered. So you really need to learn how to position yourself. Aquatic physical therapy is one, one of my favorites. I a one therapy pool with a physical therapist and it's using the buoyancy of the water. So it's taking weight off those joints. It's taking weight off those areas where it's painful to walk. So it's a great alternative to land physical therapy. Helps with that muscle relaxation and it also has resistant training. Okay, here's that aerobic conditioning. We all need to function, right? Shown by multiple, multiple studies to decrease all different types of pain. By, by releasing those endor endorphins, quieting that alarm system. This is a, the explanation that I give to my patients. We can start off like that 80 year old lady with the water, that's okay, we can do that. Five minutes, take a break, do your physical therapy exercises, practice your pain coping skills, and another five minutes. But you're young, you're gonna progress a lot more than, a lot faster than that 80 year old lady may be progressing. I encourage low impact yoga, cycling, walking at a face, fast pace and swimming. Sleep hygiene, I can't stress this enough. Pain loves it when you don't sleep because when you have poor sleep, you have increased body fatigue, difficulty concentrating, alterations in your mood and really an overall inability to cope well with that pain. So this is kind of a longer one. You guys are really welcome to have access to my slides but the biggest thing that I want you to notice all the teenagers in the room here Recommend no electronics in the bedroom. That blue light from your cell phone that can activate your muscles or activate your mind, wake you up. And we all know how, how attempting it is to look at that random Snapchat that's coming through. So we need to take those out. Lifestyle changes, set a daily schedule. Um, one of, we have an inpatient pay program at Cincinnati Children's. And one of the first things that we do when our patients come in is we give them their schedule. It's hung up on the wall. 
every hour they have something, no negotiations. Out of your room during the day, you gotta decrease that isolation. And promoting relaxation activities, art therapy, music therapy, getting out in nature. And then the balanced diet and weight control. So the big takeaways that I really wanna drive home that the other um, presenters have done a fantastic job of doing it is multidisciplinary approach is only effective if all parts are implemented. And biggest thing, if you take away one thing, we focus on function, function, function. Thank you so much. Good evening, my name is Jenny Jamison and I am a parent of two children with um, pancreatitis. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, what it is that we have dealt with, but also to just say, my goodness, I couldn't tell you anything other than what you've been told tonight. What um, an excellent group of people to give you such great information. And it was so, um, kind of affirming for me as well as a parent because a lot of that we learned just through experimenting. Um, my daughter, my oldest daughter is 18 years old and she was diagnosed when she was 16 years old with pancreatitis. But that came about two years after um, my, I have another daughter who is 16 years old and she was diagnosed at four years old. Their um, father has pancreatitis as well. And so clearly this is a genetic thing with us. I do have two other children. So I have four children total and um, the youngest two have not shown symptoms yet. And we have not done the genetic testing on them just because um, I, I, I don't wanna know. And so, um, so a little bit of a different history. The daughter who was diagnosed at four years old her journey through pancreatitis has been very different than my daughter that was diagnosed at 16 years old. And so in dealing with pain, um, it really gave us a very broad um, group of symptoms that we had to deal with. And, and it was very surprising. So the daughter diagnosed at 16 years old probably had pancreatitis for a lot longer, but we didn't pick up on it. Possibly her pain toleration is different. Um, we, she had um, some food allergies and so we attributed a lot of her pain to food allergies and so, you know, you just, it, even though we had a child, we knew it was a genetic thing, it wasn't something that we looked for in her until her pain increased and we were not able to um, control it at all. So. I'm going to go back to Addie. When she was four years old, her dad saw her um, walking across the classroom and her teacher said, you know, she keeps saying her chest is hurting, her chest is hurting. And she said, I really, I think you need to come get her. And so he saw her walking across the classroom and the way that she hunched and she was carrying herself. He said, I'd like to go have, take her in and have her um, my pace and amylase checked. And so we did, and it was off the charts. And so that's where our journey began as caretakers. Um, we spent a lot of time um, just managing pain a lot of it. And so to hear about the interdisciplinary teams and how they work together. And, and I will tell you that we now are patients at Cincinnati Children's, um, but we spent many, many years where we were not patients there. And it is definitely, it makes a big difference. Our doctor and our, um, our family doctor here, practitioner, he did a great job. We live in Northeast Oklahoma. And so there are no pancreas care clinics here. And of course, we wouldn't have even known to look for that. Um, we kind of came, we stumbled into it through a series of events. Um, but for many years, we treated Addie, um, we just, we treated the symptoms and she would be fine for a while and then she would begin to hurt. And so we did, and we started with ibuprofen every time when she would say, my chest is hurting. And so that was our, our way of communicating and knowing that we probably were about to go into an attack. Um, and so we would then begin to question her. 
what's the, on a scale of one to 10, how bad do you think you're hurting? And, and as a four-year-old, you know, you get all sorts of different versions of that. Um, so, but every time that she would say my chest is hurting, we would say, so one to 10, how did this feel in compared to the last time? You know, so we just did a lot of talking with her, a lot of communicating, a lot of comparing, and she was able to give us those differences kind of. And so that we went on with that through the years. Um, we found lots of comfort items for them. Um, in order to help, we did uh, corn bags or rice bags. And I don't know if you all know what those are, but they're just almost like small pillowcases that are filled with rice and you can freeze them or you can heat them. And she liked the heat and she liked the little bit of pressure on it. And she would kind of fold over it. Um, she is, I, she is, a gymnast, she is a dancer. And so she folds herself up like a pretzel in all sorts of different ways, usually on the floor. I don't know why she always goes to the floor whenever she's hurting, um, but she, she does all sorts of things to kind of keep that movement, I think. And I always said, I think she's trying to get away from the pain, you know, she's, she's moving around, but it probably is helping to alleviate some of that. Um, so we did, we just really talked to her a lot. We would watch her very closely and we would watch her to, you know, we would watch her facial expressions. We would watch to see, is she eating or is she not eating or when she's eating, what happens whenever, um, whenever she does eat, what does that look like for her? And so her face would give it away a lot of times. Um, we noticed in the summers that in the summer she seemed to have more attacks. And so we um, began to think, you know, it's probably a dehydration thing. So we always just tried to keep her very hydrated and watch for that. Um, again, we were doing a lot of things just by experiment and um, trying to, you know, if it got too far, then we would give our doctor a call and we would just say, you know, we think maybe we need to, maybe we need something a little stronger, but, we did, we used, um, um, we started with ibuprofen every time we would go back and forth with the Tylenol on that. And then we would, if that didn't take care of it, we would go to the hydrocodone. Addiction is something that is a part of, of our family. Um, I don't know that there's a genetic piece of that, um, but I, I know that, that it's something that we've had to deal with in my family. And so it was just something we were very upfront with our children about. Um, from the beginning. And we even spoke with our, our other kids about saying, you know, this is, you know, we don't want you to talk about these things at school because we didn't, not, not that they couldn't talk about their pain. I mean, of course, you know, as a matter of fact, parents that are listening 100% be in great communication with educators. Um, if you have a, a diagnosis, you'll want an education plan in order to help your, your child with those absences and keeping those grades up and keeping them motivated to be in school. So, so that's just a, a side note, um, but, but it can become very painful um, if, you, if you don't have those things in order for you. Um, so we did talk to them just about um, addiction and we were just very open and honest. And, and so we wanted to make certain that they knew that, that that's something we wanted to watch out for. As, they, as their illnesses progressed, um, we talked to them about how, um, again, comparing, how did this one feel in comparison to last time? So if you thought that one was an eight, what did you think this one was? Or you think this one is an eight, so maybe that one was a six. And so we just really tried to get that pain scale down with them. And um, that really helped us to be able to communicate and know exactly where we were and if we needed to hospitalize and get the IV fluids and start the morphine or, or whatever it would be. Um, I will just say that having two children with the same disease and, and being diagnosed at different points in their lives, um, it was different. And, and even though they are the same family, same father, same mother, all of that, um, it was different for both of them. Their pain tolerance was different. We believe um, the things that they experienced, the symptoms were a little bit different. For my 16 year old, also, she began to notice that right before she, she, she put together, she said, mama, I had that attack. And one week later I started my period. And then she said, mama, you know, the next month, mama, I had that really bad attack. And then the next week I started my period. And so we shared that with um, our team and they referred us. And, and so we did do some birth control just to, to, you know, kind of help with that as well. So, so that was um, something that, we were, um, that we watched out for. So, um, 
there are lots of different things that I, I could tell you. I would be happy to just answer questions from a parent's perspective. Um, I think that um, a lot of the things that we did as parents, the doctors tonight have mentioned as well. And so um, I think mostly I would just share that, that daughters both experiencing the same disease, um, it still was very different. So you just have to know your child and just really talk to them. So thanks for letting me come on tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Jamison, for that excellent talk and to our wonderful speakers for all the talks. I know we've gone over a little time and I, we do have two questions online that I would read out, but I just wanted to tell everyone here, um, thank you for coming and the video links will be sent to your emails and also this video session will be posted on YouTube. Um, so uh, these questions, I'm going to read out the questions and any of the panelists can, you know, take a dab at it. So how does a child and parent prepare for the child leaving home for college, leaving their support system and potentially opioids? That has to be a huge challenge. Yeah. I'm happy to start off with an, some discussion of that. That's a great question. And we do talk a lot with youth about transitioning to adult care and transitioning to college, I think it's important to start early. So one of the things we try to do is to make sure that youth understand their treatment regimen, can ask their own questions with a physician, can schedule an appointment themselves, can pick up a medication refill. And, so, and all of that can, can really be started quite early in adolescence so that they build some mastery in doing it. They can do it with you and then you can watch them do it and really give some feedback so that they feel comfortable knowing how to interface with the adult medical system when they, when they leave home. Um, I'll let others add to that too. I mean, I can, I can try to add it too. Um, so the, the transition from pediatrics to adult medicine doesn't involve pancreatology. I think it involves almost anything that we do, but it's something that we just started thinking about it and talking about it in, in pancreatitis. Um, I, I think it's very important and it should be not at the time that the kids go to college. I think the conversation should start uh, at a much younger age and the communication, you know, between the pediatric and adult providers are, I think it's very important and really preparing the child and, you know, uh, and there, there are transition documents. I mean, if you go to transition.org, you know, got transition, like got milk, you know, there's just so many things. I mean, you can prepare your kids too, just, you know, the knowing what medications they're taking and, um, you know, depending on the age, uh, I mean, it goes even to 12. Uh, it's crazy, but, you know, just so that they take part and they start taking ownership of their medication because you move into the adult world, it's just completely different. Um, there is actually an effort, um, I mean, because Inspire is, you know, with the Proceed, I mean, there's, it's the adult cohorts. I mean, there, there are efforts. We're thinking more and more about this and there are actually, uh, there's, there's a paper that, uh, that I'm involved in just kind of just, just thinking about some of the guidelines about where you should even start thinking about it. Uh, but I think communication and involving the families, involving the kids um, is, is the key. And having the centers, the pediatric and adult centers, really with the teams that, you know, we all talk about the same thing, uh, present to address those issues. Anyway, I'm going to stop now. The only thing I would add to that at all is this is a much smaller community than you probably realize. Many of us go to the same meetings with our adult colleagues and um, we have very good lines of communication to them. I recently had a patient move from Atlanta to the Bay Area and got him in with Dr. Parks in Stanford, who I was able to reach out to. So um, it's a well-connected well community. Um, I agree with everything Dr. Yoshimbe said, get them prepared earlier, but then um, lay, uh, your providers can help as well connect you with adult programs. Thank you for that. And I'm also going to add that, um, just emphasize what Dr. Freeman had also mentioned his, in his talk, the pancreatitis passport is also a good way to have all that information in one place. And that resource can be downloaded from the Naskigan website. So you can tell your provider, but it's also free for download by the public. 
The second question is um, from Mrs. Whitcomb. Um, thank you so much for all this information. My husband and I are curious as to what percentage of children have symptoms gone by adult. So I'll let Dr. Uch or Dr. Freeman take a uh, start with that. Oh, uh, you mean the, um, the symptoms of pancreatitis? Um, you know, it depends on the, uh, what, the, uh, what we're talking about. I mean, you know, the, the etiologies, um, you know, if it is acute recurrent pancreatitis and we're looking at the gallstone pancreatitis, I mean, you take the gallstones and, you know, the child is going to stop having pancreatitis. Uh, but if we're talking about a gene mutation driven, um, you know, pancreatitis, I mean, we expect that at least from the information that we know that, um, I mean, that's going to be ongoing uh, and probably depends on the type of the mutation and how significant the mutation. But again, I think this genetics is something that we're learning more and more. Uh, and there are more genes involved and how it impacts the disease progression. I, I don't see that the symptoms go away um, over time. Uh, maybe others uh, can uh, talk on, on that one. No, um, I, I agree with Dr. Uj. I, I half joking with many of my patients that if I had the pancreatitis pill, I would be a billionaire very quickly. Um, we all wish we had it. We, we do. Um, the analogy I sometimes give, especially for these hereditary patients, is it's like diabetes or some of our other you know, conditions. We don't have the cure, unfortunately. We are treating symptoms. And, and the one thing about pediatrics in particular that has been hammered home is we have the opportunity to intervene earlier before some of that sensitization occurs. So we do our best to try to control the symptoms. As Dr. Palermo talked to you about, you know, how to manage those symptoms, get to functionality, as Dr. Hartzell talked about. But I agree with Dr. H. It does unfortunately not just go away. So much. And I'm just going to ask, you know, um, one more question to Dr. Palermo. I mean, thank you so much for all those resources that you shared. So um, some of these studies that are ongoing in Inspire dealing with cognitive behavioral therapy for children with pancreatitis, can patients enroll in these studies by themselves or do they have to be enrolled by their providers? Yeah, they actually can be enrolled by self-referral. So they're welcome to fill out an interest form and we can go through eligibility to find out if they're a good fit for the study. So it can be either through referral or through self-referral. Well, thank you very much. I don't think we have any other questions online and I know we are already like five minutes over the time. So I just want to thank all our speakers again and everyone for coming for this event and thank you for joining us and uh, it will be posted on YouTube, but you also get the video links in the email you registered with. Thank you and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Everyone.